Hello and welcome to our webinar today. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Dart. I'm editor of HVP magazine. Um, this webinar is going to cover recent updates to iGEM's uh, gas industry unsafe situations procedure. Uh, I'm here with two uh, excellent speakers. Um, the first is Dave Bendel, Chair of the Unsafe Situations Panel, and Jonathan Palmer, Technical Support Officer at the Gas Safe Register. Um, before we kind of get them kicking things off, um, just wanted to let you know that um, we've got a Q&A at the end of this session. So please do feel free to kind of answer, ask questions as the presentation goes on, you know, ideally directed to either Jonathan or Dave. Um, if you just use the kind of Q&A option at the bottom, uh, just type in your question and it'll be, and it's kind of just that simple really. And we'll be able to see, see them as they come through and we'll obviously try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, uh, one question I'm sure a lot of you will have that I'd like to answer now is that um, uh, this, this session is being recorded, so uh, we will be uploading it to uh, the HVP YouTube channel and also the HVP um, uh, website in the days following. So uh, without further ado, I'd, I'd like to kind of pass over to uh, Jonathan Palmer to kind of get things kind of kicked uh, underway and then you know obviously pick up after the presentation so uh, Jonathan over to you thank you Joe hello my name is John Palmer so just quickly this is a joint presentation between RGM and the gas safe register on the second edition of RGM G11 so just quickly I'll start the PowerPoint uh, with me. technical issues <laughs> Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. There we go. So, as I say, my name is John Palmer. I'm a gas safe registered technical officer, technical support officer, and I'm here with Dave Bendel. Good afternoon, evening, everyone. Dave Bendel, and as the slide says, I'm the chair of the IGEM G11 panel, which is the gas industry unsafe situations procedure. So I think before we start, just better give everyone a very brief overview of who IGEM are, what they're about. Um, IGEM stands for the Institution of Gas Engineers and Managers, and it's the professional body for the gas industry uh, and as you can see from the drawing there, pretty much covers almost from the wellhead right through to the burner tip on a cooker. So it's uh, fairly unique in covering both upstream and downstream of the meter. Um, it produces a number of standards, as you can see, covering transmission, distribution, safety, legislation, measurement, and what we're talking about today, gas utilization. And importantly, it's licensed with the Engineering Council, so as it can award professional titles, Engineering Technician, Incorporated Engineer and Chartered Engineer. It's been around for a while, as you can see, it was founded in 1863, uh, receiving its Royal Charter in 1929. And obviously it's our patron is Her Majesty the Queen. So uh, without further ado, we will move on to talk about this particular iGEM document. So we're looking at edition two of iGEM G11, the unsafe sits, as I like to call it. Um, it's been around in one form or another since about 1998, uh, coming into the custodian uh, or cust custodial ship of iGEM in around 2018. So, um, Okay, this presentation covers the areas of significant change to the second edition of IGEM G11, um, including, in, sorry, <laughs> including the industry standard update, which is 102, which gives an, an industry standard update. Basically, what that does is it gives you, it doesn't, it's not a full coverage, but it will give the, um, the, the, the basic changes, the large changes. Okay, and we'll try and cover what, how, the GSR use, the gas safe register use the unsafe situations during inspections. Okay. So as you said, on the 15th of January, 2021, the IGEM published the revision to the GIUSPs. 
The revised edition supersedes the provision to the, the previous version, which has now been withdrawn. And as I said, Industry 102 provides an overview and highlights areas of significant change in the recently published second edition of the GSRU, GRUSP. So procedure has been drafted by a panel made up of experienced representatives. Um, and I have to say, as chair, I am very fortunate. It's a great panel with members from across a wide range in the industry. And importantly, we have both gas safe register and executive on the panel, which really keeps us sort of on track and ensuring that we are compliant with this. So the procedures used by gas safe register competent persons when dealing with unsafe situations in domestic and non-domestic premises supplied with natural gas or liquefied petroleum gas. Now, when we're pulling this together as a panel, obviously we're referencing constantly the gas safety installation and use regulations and their approved codes of practice. Um, now, HSE produce a guidance document to the gas safety regs and the ACOP, uh, and it's got the title of L56. So anyone working in the industry or working in general is bound by the Health and Safety at Work Act, um, and that applies to all workers. That sits at the top of the hierarchy of legislation. Gas safety installation and use regs sort of refine the, the requirements of the Health and Safety at Work Act specifically to gas fitting. Um, and then we on the panel of the unsafe sits try and bring about a guidance document that helps people comply with their requirements under the gas safety regs and the Health and Safety at Work Act. So the HSE document L56 doesn't actually use the terms at risk ID. Instead, it talks in the term of danger. And so as a panel, you know, we have to look to the guidance produced in L56, specifically the regulation 34, which is the use of appliances. And that introduces the phrase known or suspected could constitute a danger. Um, and then we look further on and it mentions both danger and emergency situations. So it's this use of known or suspected along with danger and emergency uh, situations that derives different risk levels that we've arrived at calling an immediate danger and at risk for a potential danger, if you want to give it a, a another phrase. Um, so this is further supported by the guidance that obviously as a standard gas engineer, they cannot enforce a disconnection for an at risk unsafe situation. But if it's an emergency situation, the uh, transporter, the emergency service provider has powers that they can use to enforce a disconnection. And that's where ID comes in. So those are the sort of main differentiators that we've pick through HSE's guidance and why over many years, the terms ID and AR have been in use with that sort of two levels of risk. Thank you, John. So some years ago, we removed NCS from the document. That was to maintain focus. Um, it is the unsafe situations procedure, the gas safety regs, cover unsafe situations and the requirement to notify. So it was not deemed appropriate to have something called not current standards, which by definition was safe within a document that's called the unsafe situations. Uh, and in fact, if we look at, go back to um, HSE's L56 guidance document to regulation 34, it says the requirement applies only to unsafe appliances. It does not cover those which are merely substandard and considered in need of minor improvement to bring them up to current standards. So the unsafe sits purely covers unsafe situations, but that doesn't mean an engineer should ignore what was not to current standards. Um, you've got to I suppose, assess 
what you're going to inform a customer of. So the example I often use is the usefulness of informing a customer. So if you've got a 20 year old boiler with a flue for argument's sake, that's too close to an external corner, yet it's worked perfectly for 20 years. And the cost of moving that boiler will say 75 millimeters to the left to make it compliant with the standard isn't sort of financially viable or is going to make a tangible difference to the safety of the appliance. Um, so informing the customer of that, you need to make a judgment call on. Whereas if you were to come across a fire stood on carpet where it's fairly easy to fit a hearth underneath, then that's a tangible improvement. Um, so it's always these risk assessments that you all make every day, consciously and subconsciously, that allows you to sort of determine what is the best information for your customer. But yeah, we shouldn't say not to current standards doesn't exist because it does. What we need to do is at, work out what we can do about informing the customers and what use that information is. Um, I think there's what, yeah. And importantly, this final bit doesn't mean that you can carry out work that's substandard. It's a requirement that work is done in accordance with the current standards and legislative requirements. So yeah, NCS hasn't gone away for say, it's just not in the unsafe sits because it's not an unsafe situation. Thank you, John. John, you're on mute. I do apologise. <laughs> so the information provided in this procedure is relevant to all Commission gas appliances and equipment, uh, pipe work obviously as well, in both domestic and non-domestic premises. Based on an assessed risk, it aims to provide guidance to competent engineers when dealing with various situations which currently or may in the future affect safety. So as Dave has said, OK, uh, it, it's purely to be used for unsafe situations and whether they are unsafe, ID, or whether they could be unsafe, which would be AR. OK, the priority for gas engineers when countering an unsafe situation is to safeguard life and property. <clears throat> it's essential that gas engineers are able to identify gas equipment which presents a danger or potential danger and take prompt and corrective actions to eliminate such danger. Okay, when an engineer is carrying out new gas installation work, they should also ensure that appliance installations, the appliance installation is installed and fully commissioned in accordance with the GSIUR manufacturer's instructions and other appropriate standards. If the appliance installation cannot be fully commissioned, the appliance installation must not be left connected to the gas supply. The gas supply to the appliance installation must be disconnected and sealed with an appropriate fitting. It should be labelled to the effect that it must not be used until full and proper commissioning tests have been carried out. So as Dave has already previously said, uh, just because NCS has been removed from the unsafe situations doesn't mean that it's gone away. And when every time you install an appliance or pipework, it must be done fully in, uh, in fully in, in um, sorry, my voice left me. Must be done in accordance with, with all standards and the manufacturer's instructions. So, when assessing whether any gas appliance installation is installed correctly. The engineer shall in first instance consult the manufacturer's instructions where available, which may deviate from the appropriate standards for the appliance or installation. So the manufacturer's instructions will overrule the British standards. Okay. When the manufacturers of the appliance installation are not available, the assessment against the requirements of the current version of the appropriate standards shall be carried out. So the general rule is the manufacturer's instructions will overrule the British standards. However, in the absence of the manufacturer's instructions, you revert back to the British standards. 
All engineers working on or encountering appliances installations that are unsafe shall classify the unsafe situation as ID or AR. Where work is not carried out, a visual risk assessment shall be undertaken on those appliances installations that are encountered for evident safety related defects. And this procedure applied where appropriate within the limits of the engineer's competence. If unsure of the safety of appliance and meat installation, further guidance should be sought immediately. So basically what that means is if you're there working on a boiler and you walk through and you see a fire in there, you're not working on the fire. However, you must do a visual inspection on all gas appliances. So you would need to visually inspect that fire. If you see signs of sooting, so if you see, for instance, the picture, if you can see there's dark marks across the top of the fireplace, you can answer that signs of spillage. Therefore, you would need to, whether you're working on the appliance or not, you would need to um, de deem that as immediately dangerous and follow the unsafe situations procedure. Okay, what we have here is a flowchart that appears quite early in the document, the unsafe sits, um, and it's the basic principles that the panel uses um, when trying to come up with our guidance as to whether something falls into the immediately dangerous category, the at-risk category, or safe to use. And ultimately we would like everything in that last category. But, um, we have a legal requirement to ensure that the ones in the first two are enacted upon. So it's fairly simple. You can read it in the document, but it basically says if you turn it on and it's going to harm you there and then, it falls into the ID, immediately dangerous, as the name implies. If, however, there's a defect on it that you have concerns about that could lead to an unsafe situation, it's an at-risk scenario. Um, and if it doesn't meet either of those criteria after thoroughly assessing it, then it's going to fall in the safe to use. Um, so that's our basic principles whenever we're uh, given a, a sort of example to put in the document that we work through. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I say, when we put examples in the document, they're contained in the tables. That's probably the part of the document most people use. It's very keen to point out that that flowchart I've just shown you is the sort of risk assessing approach to every possible scenario you might come across. So the tables we've got are, the, are not exhaustive and you might have different circumstances on site. Next paragraph, please. Um, and this is where we've made a significant statement in this latest edition. We're saying engineers do need to exercise engineering judgment, their actions within their area of competence and where in doubt seek guidance you know and finally this is the key bit when applying the classifications used in this procedure competent engineers should be able to justify their rationale based on the situation on site examples in the procedure are not exhaustive or, or definitive and the final decision in applying the classification lies with the competent engineer on site um, and, and the reason that's in there is everyone has a requirement again, going back to the Health and Safety at Work Act and everything else, to undertake risk assessments. It's not just about following a book. This document offers you guidance and tries to point people in the right direction, but it can't be all things to all men because every situation encountered on site is unique. So there has to be some autonomy given to the engineer to risk assess that situation and apply some autonomy based on their training, knowledge and experience. So, next slide, please. Oh, and there we go. Keep records, always worth doing. So, gas appliances found to be unsafe shall be classified as either immediately dangerous, as we've said before, or at risk, dependent on the level of danger. So when you identify an unsafe situation, principal objective is to make safe and advise the responsible person not to use the appliance or the installation. And in carrying out these actions, 
the gas user or a responsible person shall be informed of the reasons and advice that they're carrying out in the interest of the gas safety. One of the chaps, sorry, can we just sorry, go back? Sorry, sorry. One, one of the changes a little while back when NCS was removed was that the messaging to the customer remains exactly the same, whether it's ID or at risk, and that's do not use. You know, as I've said before, can enforce a disconnection on an at risk, but we ought to be giving a consistent message to customers of do not use. And this came about partly from a coroner's inquest, sadly into the death of a, a lady. And the coroner being a sort of third party bystander with no gas knowledge actually asked me, you know, what's the difference between at risk and immediately dangerous? And I started saying what I just said earlier on about one's an immediate risk, one's has the potential for risk. And, and he said, well, Mr. Bendel, is not every at risk an ID in waiting. The only thing is you can't say when it's likely to happen. And that kind of resonated in this particular death. That was actually the case. We, we would have classified it as at risk. And sadly, this person continued to use the appliance. And at one point, it became immediately dangerous, killing her. And that's why the wording changed to the emphasis of do not use, regardless of whether it's at risk or immediately dangerous. Consistency of the message is do not use. Thank you, John. So having said all of that, there are a limited number of cases where turning off won't remove the risk. Um, they're highlighted within the tables. Uh, and the most common example is a built over PE service or even a LPG bulk storage vessel incorrectly located too close to the building. Um, if you turn off the gas, it doesn't make that bulk tank any further away and it doesn't turn the PE service into not being under the building. So um, that's, that's why some of these examples, turning off doesn't remove the risk. Most cases it will, that's why there are some exceptions. Thank you. Okie dokie. So where a registered business comes and encounters an immediate dangerous or at risk situation, as they've said, you attach a danger do not use label to the appliance or installation in a prominent position. When appliance is concealed, fit an additional danger do not use label in a prominent position, for example, on a compartment door. So again, the stickers are generally all now the same, and you would use the same one for an ID or an AR where you encounter a business, an immediately dangerous or at-risk situation. Why is that going back to that one? Regardless, you should emphasize, sorry, you should complete a warning notice. Sorry, do, do apologize. You need to complete a warning notice, which will emphasize the word danger do not use. Regardless of the format used, obtain a signature from the gas user responsible person as both a record of receipt and understanding. Before leaving site, a copy shall be issued to the gas safe user responsible person and keep a copy for your records. If no one is present, leave a copy on site to alert any future users. Now, we get quite a lot of phone calls lately on the technical helpline in regards to this, asking whether you can use a digital format. Um, we answer, the answer is yes, technically you can. Um, so you would need to make sure what we would say though before is you must before you leave you must ensure that the responsible person has received the copy so if you're going to send them an email we would always say wait till they to the comp the person can receive there is email and you can check that they've got it because otherwise they may not have actually received it you may have put the email address in wrong or there may be a problem you know for them receiving it and also if there is no one there so if, for instance you're doing uh, a void property and there's nobody present, obviously, if that's the case, you would have to leave the paper version because you won't be able to send it to somebody who's not there. So whilst, yes, you can use the digital versions, there is always going to be a time when you are going to need to use a paper copy. So clearly indicate on the warning notice the type of fault and the action taken and any remedial action required. If the gas user responsible person refuses to sign the warning notice, record this detail. 
And if the gas user responsible person is not the owner of the appliance or installation, also provide details of the unsafe situation in writing to the owner, for example, the landlord or managing an agent. In this version, in addition to, we chose to um, put some further emphasis on riddle. Um, so, we've got riddle regulation 11.2, that applies to utilisation engineers and it requires registered gas businesses and engineers to report any gas fitting, including appliances, and flues or ventilation used with appliances, which are dangerous to such an extent they have caused or are likely to cause death, unconsciousness, or a person being taken to hospital. And that's due to the design, construction, manner of installation, modification, or incorrect servicing of the gas fitting that could or has resulted in an accidental leakage of gas incomplete combustion of gas or inadequate removal of products of combustion of gas. That's what we commonly refer to as poor workmanship or design. Now, this isn't the actual wording of the regulations. The regulations bullet the uh, accidental leakage of gas, incomplete combustion of gas and inadequate removal of combustion products. As a panel, we thought that was confusing uh, some people as to what the trigger levels were for completing a riddle. Um, so we've just reordered it in the layout. So as the trigger levels of death, unconsciousness or taking to hospital of a person, highlight the trigger levels. Otherwise, the intent is exactly the same. Um, now, riddle is a legal requirement um, and applies to us all. Um, and we wanted to just give this bit of clarity to try and help people understand what that requirement was. Um, it is very similar, you could say, to ID, because ID has the potential to cause death, unconsciousness, or taking the hospital of a person. So they do sort of fit together very well. But we must remember, unsafe sits is a guidance document, riddle is law. And they sit very closely together, but they are distinct and separate requirements. Thank you, John. So what do we report under Riddle 11.2? Well, it's got to meet the criteria we've just read out. Um, and most, as I've just said, are likely to be ID situations. There are a few ID situations that might not be reportable under Riddle, even when down to design. And that is again, dependent on the sort of bespoke risk assessment on site, comparing it against the requirements of the rid riddle legislation. So an example I, I could think of here would be a small gas escape in an outside meter box. We'll say for argument's sake, a three millibar escape. Outside ventilated space, unsafe sits, we would call that immediately dangerous. Any gas escape, that you smell outside of tolerance, whatever, is ID. Now, some of the reasoning for that ID is because we didn't want a two tier level of um, gas escapes. The, we want to keep them all as ID and drive the correct customer behaviors, engineer behaviors, you know, make it safe, report it, that sort of thing. You could argue that that small outside leak in a ventilated area doesn't meet the criteria of riddle because it is it likely to cause death unconsciousness or a person being taken to hospital possibly not but as i've already said every circumstance is different and it needs to be assessed on site using your training knowledge and experience um, and then measured against the criteria for riddle and that's what we're trying to point out within this latest version of the unsafe sits. Thank you, John. So when we do come across one, we've got to be mindful that some gas fittings are dangerous due to a lack of maintenance and they're not required to be reported under riddle, even if they're found in rented accommodations. And, and that's even though that landlords have duty to maintain gas appliances, flues and pipework in a safe condition. However, if you find 
and if fittings are found, which includes appliances by definition in rented accommodation or commercial installations that are dangerous due to a lack of maintenance, you can send details to the HSE as a concern using the link below. Uh, and HSE will then decide whether or not to investigate the matter further. And additionally, non-gas safety defects are generally not reportable. And for those examples would include damaged or inappropriate electrical connections and hot water cylinders without pressure relief. So Riddle 11.2 is for dangerous gas fittings. The clues there, it's for gas. Um, but some, some things even then aren't reportable, as we've said here, uh, lack of maintenance is not reportable. Thank you, John. So we've come across something that's likely to um, cause death, unconsciousness, or a person being taken to hospital. We complete an 11-2, we do that online and report it to the HSE within 14 days of coming across it. Um, there we go, it's on the HSE's website, the link's there. Um, there is also a telephone number for reporting deaths and injuries under RID or 11-1, but 11-1 primarily concerns the public gas transporter, so the emergency service provider. When we clarified the criteria in the unsafe sits of Riddor, there was concern that poor workmanship that was previously been perhaps, shall we say, incorrectly reported under Riddle, but with the best of intentions, trying to flag this poor workmanship, this poor workmanship would be lost, you know, and almost accepted. And, and to us as a panel, that wasn't acceptable. So we've worked very hard with... Um, gas safe register to ensure that there's a re reporting mechanism in place. So if we just click again, please, John. Yeah. So if we've got something that's due to poor workmanship, but doesn't quite meet the requirements of Riddle, but we need to flag it because it's not decent workmanship, use the link here, we can report it to gas safe register. And importantly, that goes to the people that have the capacity to get out there inspect, risk assess that business, that person, and take the appropriate action. And it probably means far slicker inspection process than going through the RID or route. Um, so click again, please, John. Yeah, again, there is always the option of using the HSE's reporting concerns, but I think for poor workmanship that is unsafe, doesn't quite meet the criteria of RID or go direct to gas safe register it goes to the heart heart of the matter and they can get on with taking the appropriate course of action so that's probably giving you a few decisions going well how do i know whether i report to hse under riddle hse under a concern or is this something that i go to gas safe register hopefully that flow chart which is appendix seven in the unsafe sits just gives a fairly simplistic route of a thought process as to what scenario would be reported to which body. Uh, so that flowchart's in there. Uh, it's an aid memoir and hopefully simplifies the process. So that was Riddle. If we go back to table one, these are our um, classifications of unsafe situations. So it contains the types of examples which fall under the ID or AR category. And we try and contain the most common examples which an engineer is likely to encounter. Um, and there are a few uncommon ones because they're unusual and we just need to point people in the way that we think they should be thinking and assessing the situation. As with any list, it's not exhaustive. And what we've tried to do is group them by the outcome. So you won't see hole in a boiler case. But you think, well, what will that lead to? Well, that could lead to leakage of combustion products. So you will find leakage of combustion products. So we're just trying to group up with, into what the outcome will be to try and make it easier to navigate. Um, so. Here we go, example of the tables. As I've said before, we come back to, we need to exercise engineering judgment. Um, 
to their actions within their area of competence and where there's doubt, it's important to seek further guidance. Here we go. These are the main changes in edition two uh, by their table reference number. Um, 3.6 is fairly straightforward. It's just reinforcing the fact that access to operate an ECV is required by law. Uh, 3.7 is just offering up further guidance from the IGM UP1 series of uh, procedures. Um, 3.11, this was around supporting of pipes, pipes showing um, signs of distress and corrosion and the like was revised. You may have seen uh, TB from Gas Safe Register about supporting pipe work, and this was as a result of an incident. It's, so the text has been revised to reflect that. 6.6 um, .6 was about supporting of flues um, and the like, and it's important here that this is all about, we again, looking at what the outcome is. So it's an at-risk category, incorrectly supported flu, but it's only at risk if it's likely to lead to a disconnection. If it says the flu must be clipped every 1.2 meters and it's every 1.3, that's not at risk. We need to assess what its likelihood of a breach of integrity is. Um, there's some guidance on classifying damaged seals in 7.2 and in 13.9 is about inspecting um, LPG regulators without overpressure shutoff devices. Um, LPG industry uh, put out a statement saying that regulators over 10 years ought to be changed. Um, so it's just highlighting those points within the document. And so on every page, because we've said ID and Riddle are sort of pretty well linked, there's a reminder of the uh, Riddle criteria on the top of every page. So as you can assess the situation encountered um, to consider whether it meets the requirements of Riddle. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna do a few little uh, kind of videos and pictures here for you now, just to, see if you kind of understand where we're coming from. So before we start on this one, I just need to state for the point of this exercise, you can take it that the temporary continuity bonding is attached and the safe to touch has been carried out. So you've attended a property to renew a gas pipe work after a gas leak was identified. So there you go, so it's bubbling up. So during a tightness test, you identify that the ECV is letting by. So what actions would you take? Okay, so the answer is you notify the, G, the gas emergency contact center, or in the case of LBG, you notify the gas supplier. So you make safe as described in the document IGM UP1 series of procedures. Okay, so basically, but this is one of those times that Dave was talking about earlier that the removing the risk by turning off the ECV. So if you turn off the ECV, you aren't removing the risk because it's still letting by. But you would need to notify the gas emergency service provider that their ECV is letting by. Okay, the next one. So you visit a property to serve as a boiler for a new customer. As part of your risk assessment, you identify that the chimney flue has not been sealed either internally or externally. The boiler has been stored for a few years. There is no evidence of combustion of product, in product combustion re-entering the property. Is this riddle reportable? So the answer to that one is that no, the scenario two does not meet the criteria for Ridor 11.2. Ridor 11.2 requires a registered gas engineers 
to report any gas fittings, including appliances or flues or ventilation when used with the appliance, which are dangerous to such an extent, they are likely to have caused death, unconsciousness, or taking to hospital of a person due to the design, construction, manner of installation, modification, or incorrect servicing of the gas fitting that could or has resulted in the accidental leakage of gas, incomplete combustion of gas, or inadequate removal of products of combustion of gas. This is commonly referred to as poor workmanship and design. In this instance, as we stated, there's no evidence of the products of combustion coming back into the property. Therefore, it would not be ID. And so incidentally, all Riddle reportables would need to be immediately dangerous because if it's not immediately dangerous, it's just at risk. It's not going to be likely to cause a death or consciousness or taken to hospital. OK, so number three, the final one. You're purging and relighting appliances in an elderly customer's home. When you light the hob, you notice a problem with the flick flame picture. So I want to start that one. So would you classify this as immediately dangerous or at risk? So there's obviously a problem with the flame picture, but it is neither ID or AR. Why is that? The reason is the elderly customer is using an ebulizer, which will affect the flame picture or rather more the flame color. If you ventilate the premises and turned off the nebulizer, if possible to do so, the flame picture would return to normal. So where you can see the kind of reddish tinge to the flame, that would show that it's kind of not over oxygenated because you can't do that, but the oxygen is affecting the flame picture, but it's remaining steady and it's remaining safe and it is not going to be causing incomplete combustion. Therefore, it would just be an advisory that they didn't use the nebulizer as close to the hook hook arb if possible. Okay, and finally, if you'd like a copy of IGMG 11, you can uh, download a copy free of charge from the IGM website, which is there, and I'm not gonna feed that out. You could also download a copy free by signing onto your online register, GasSafe registered account at gassaferegister.co.uk and go to the engineer's login. Alternatively, if you don't wish to do either of those, if you phone GasSafe Technical on the phone, we will happily email out a copy to you. Okay, that's the end of the video. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, uh, John and Dave. That, that was really insightful. And, and obviously I can see that we've had kind of a, a fair few questions come in. So uh, I'll probably try to kick us off. And obviously okay. um, if either of you want to jump in on, on this one, then let me know. So first question we've got is from uh, Mike Smith. Um, if you test an appliance and find that uh, 26.9 checks are all in order, including FGA readings, except for low CO2 percentage, is the appliance AR? I can't see any risk, but 7.6 of the GI USP infers that it is. Uh, I'll take that one if you don't mind, Dave. That one, that one would be at risk. The reason it is at risk is, is the flue gas analysis is outside of the manufacturer's instructions. Therefore, it's not burning. Yeah, the flue gas analysis tells you if the appliance is burning correctly. In a modern boiler, the CO2 is probably the most important thing. So the fact that your ratio and your parts per million, your CO parts per million are correct, it, it's the, you've got the main one, which is your CO2, which is incorrect. Therefore, the appliance is not burning correctly, in which case it would be deemed as at risk. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hopefully that answers your question, Mike. Um, uh, moving on to the next one, the question from uh, Dave Crocker. Um, I was under the understanding that you had to seek permission from the site before you disconnect the gas supply. Has this now changed? Uh, happy to take that one. The answer is no. Um, yeah. No engineer has permission to disconnect anyone's um, appliances. Uh, all, all of the gas safety installation and use regs say you must seek permission. If that permission's declined, then you record that on your paperwork. Um, that's for at-risk situations. 
For ID, exactly the same. You still don't have uh, the ability to enforce a disconnection, which is why for ID, because it is an immediate danger, you can escalate it to the emergency service provider who do have the powers. Perfect. Great. Well, that, that sounds that's fantastic. Thank you for that, Dave. Um, next question. Uh, I think it's kind of a bit of a two-parter, so uh, bear with me here. Um, from John Gardner. Um, he's he's asked, uh, should you discover an AR situation such as a cooker hose under stress, can you repair the reported fault on the cooker, then apply the GI USP regarding the hose? And the second part, uh, he says, to explain the scenario regarding my question, the customer is happy to have the cooker repaired as it is covered under manufacturer's warranty or insurance, but relocating the cooker backplate would be chargeable, which the customer is not prepared to pay for. So uh, can I complete the cooker repair and then make safe due to the stressed hose? Um, okay, I don't so, so I'm assuming they're asking, can they say there's, a, there's an alternative repair other to the hose? So the answer there was yes, if you can work on an appliance that is at risk, that's fine. Um, what, we, what we'd rather do is we'd rather ensure the appliance has got the minimum risk possible. So the fact that you've seen an at risk, other work can be carried out. And when you finish, you can then deem that at risk when you when when you're done. The kind of easiest way to explain that is if you've got a uh, if you're interested, you've got a flue in a void, you've got a boiler with a flue in a void, and you've been asked to service the appliance. That's an at risk situation, but it doesn't mean that you can't work on that boiler because what we'd much rather do is that you work on the appliance and you work at that appliance is as safe as can possibly be, rather than just say no, that's at risk. I'm not touching it. When natural fact that risk may need to be escalated because there's other issues so to work on an appliance that is at risk yes that is fine but you still need to do the at risk um procedure at the end great i uh, hope that was what you meant i think hopefully it was uh, obviously I'm, I'm sure he can let us know if, if it's not <laughs> yeah. um uh brilliant okay so the next question apologies steve if i uh, if i get your last name wrong uh, steve ek who says, uh, what is the classification on cookers without FSD or what is the solution? Okay, I'll, I'll take that one again because <laughs> there's a ten, technical bulletin on yeah, that one. Go for Basically, it. okay, the, the, the fact that you need to fit in a, a, a cooker or a hob with an FSD, okay, this is if, they're, if, the, if the appliance is in a HMO or in a flat, the new rules state that any new gas appliance must have an FSD, not just a hob, any appliance must have an FSD. If you come up to uh, a hob that has no FSDs, but is existing, you go back to the, is it forming a risk? No, there is no risk there. It's working exactly how as it should be. It's exactly working exactly as it was designed to by the manufacturer. Your flame picture is good. Everything else is okay, okay. You come back to that not to current standards. So just because an appliance doesn't meet the current legislation does not automatically make it an unsafe situation. Perfect, brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, John. Um, cool. So moving on to the next question, getting through these and a few more coming in, which is great to, to see. Um, uh, Ian Bryson, uh, he's asked, uh, with talk of natural gas being replaced by hydrogen in the future to decarbonize heating, is information currently available or are there any works happening to understand and quantify the extent of which, uh, sorry, the extent of any not to current standards and at risk gas installations in the UK, which could be issues for consideration in relation to conversion to hydrogen? Um, I mean, it's a bit of a way away yet. They're still in testing. I can't really answer too much questions about hydrogen at the moment because we're not, uh, it's not our area as such. Um, when the hydrogen deploy does come in, then as far as I'm aware that the, the IGM G11 will still, will still apply to the hydrogen blend. Yeah, I, I think, uh, as John rightly says, it's early days at the moment in this. There, there certainly were trials going on uh, that involved existing appliances with known defects. Um, but I think it's still too early to say that one will correlate directly with the other. So it's a wait and see. Absolutely. No, it makes perfect sense. Brilliant. Um, Mark Osborne has asked, uh, does PRVs on boilers come under Riddle as a gas fitting? Um, yeah, interesting. Um, <laughs> I guess it, it's... 
it's part of the appliance um and actually prvs is the one one of the few non-gas defects that appears in the unsafe sits and the reasoning behind that was in uh, an earlier iteration of the gas safety installation and use rates document the l56 the guidance document produced by hse it had an appendix two listing unsafe situations all of which were uh, gas related bar the final one which was uh, a pressure or steam explosion caused by overheating um, and that's how the classification for a system without a prv uh, has appeared in the unsafe sits so i guess my logic on that is is there an expansion vessel how how is it accommodating its sort of expansion at the moment it is a bit of a risk assessment would it fall into an id category not quite sure but i think if you can convince yourself that that's id then i would riddle report it myself um because a steam explosion is not a nice thing to have. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Brilliant, um, excellent. Thank you for that, Dave. Um, Sean Rayson asks, is there a simple list to summarize all the changes from edition one? Yeah, this ISU 102. If you wish to have that, it's a it's a pub, it's a free to to download document. Like I say, is if you if you wish to email in to technical at gassaferegister.co.uk or by all means phone us on our 800-485-77 and we will be happy to send that out to you. Brilliant. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Luke Briggs asks, uh, would scenario two by AR flu not seal in or out or, or would it uh, be risk assessment? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I don't know if, if you can follow that. I think I think he's asking if the mm. flu isn't sealed internally and then externally, yeah. would it be at risk? The simple answer is yes, for us it would be. There is a pathway for the product's combustion to come back into the room. Uh, on an inspection, we would, at, we would defect that as an at-risk defect. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. Um, John Roche asks, uh, the flu install that you showed earlier, would that automatically be classified as AR or could a risk assessment deem that it could be NCS if movement was very slight and no POCs entering the property? Uh, it, again, it depends. It doesn't really show the outside of the property. If it's not sealed correctly at all, with that flu, if there's no if there's no support on there for me, that would be an at risk because it's a push fit flu. Um, if you had, for instance, if you had the weather collar on the outside and it was a screwed flu, you could argue the fact that the flu is secure and there's no real danger of products coming back coming back in. But for me, you, you'd be on shaky ground if you wouldn't at risk it. You can you can look as we were said in the presentation. Everything is conjective. Yeah, because uh, you know you 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 at risk it as your at risk as your risk procedure shows. Would I always agree with other people's risk session? No. Does it mean that I'm right because I work for the gas safe and you're and you're wrong? Again, no, it doesn't. Uh, it's just that our our right risk procedure would would maybe oh uh, sorry our our risk assessment would differ. But for me, uh, if the flu is if there's any movement in the flu and it's not sealed securely internally or externally, you, I'd be looking at an at risk. Perfect. Thank you. Um, great. Uh, you guys are doing well with all the quick fire questions. Still, still more coming in, which is great. Um, still got a few more minutes to kind of blast through the rest of them. Um, uh, Paul Williams has asked uh, if a boiler flu is longer than manufacturer's instructions, would it be AR or ID? Uh, again, come down to risk assessment for that. If, if the flu is too long, but your flu gas analysis is working correctly, then for me, it, it's, it, there's no one size fits all. If it's allowed to maximum six metres and you're six and a half metres, would I at risk it? Probably not. If it's nine metres, 10 metres, would I? Probably I would. If it's getting the, the, the flu gas analysis is getting dangerously close to, to the limits. There, there, with, with things like that, there is no, like, you know, if, if we, we can't say if, we can't give you examples of every um different issue and say whether it's at risk or ir uh, at risk or id or ncs it's impossible there's too many different scenarios but it, look, it comes down, again it comes down to engineering judgment it, it, is it if it's slightly over is it at risk not for me as long as your flu gas analysis is correct and it's working safely that's what you've got to ask yourself could it cause a problem if it's you know 50 percent too long possibly so yeah. and, and i think this comes back to what i was saying earlier in the presentation 
the tables won't have flew too long, but let's look at the outcome that that's likely to lead to. Is it likely to affect combustion? Yeah, well then there's a scenario for that, 7.6. If it's too long and not supported, well, it might be covered by, I think it's six something in the tables because the likelihood of disconnection has increased. So it's more about looking at what the likely outcome of that scenario of too long a flu can lead to and then seeing if there's a classification for that. But John's quite right with perfect combustion and being half a metre too long. It's not right. It's not in called, installed in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. But is it strictly unsafe? I can't see at the moment that there, there is a massive concern there. Perfect. Great. Thank you. No, that's brilliant. Um, follow up question from Steve K again um, regarding the cooker without FSD he asked yep. earlier. He's asking uh, again for a bit more clarification. So on landlord safety certificate, is, is this then safe? It would be not to current standards. Not to current standards is not an unsafe situation. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Um, Ali Stewart asks, uh, if you have a boiler with a faulty LMU and the boiler will not ignite and fails safe, must this be labelled AR? Uh, I'm not uh, sure. If it's failing safe, then it's a safe appliance, isn't it? it? You know, if an appliance is not working, it doesn't make it an unsafe situation. The appliance isn't working, it's not firing up. However, it's going into lockout or whatever, and, it, and the, the safety devices are kicking in. It's working perfectly safety. It's it's not it's not even not the current standards. It's just not working. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, so a few few more left. <laughs> We're nearing the end, so don't worry, guys. Um, <laughs> Again, there. Uh, Mark Jacob asks um, if a room sealed boiler does not achieve the gas rate, uh, is it at risk? We, we, we've discussed this one quite in depth. You know, the, it used to be the old people think there's the 5% up, 10% down rule. Um, that's not, that's for manufacturing, in all honesty. If you had an old, say an old back boiler um, where it's a fixed burner, you could argue the fact that if it's over, go over gassed or under gassed. However, you know, we get a lot of questions about, say, low working pressure. So you mean the boiler working pressure is low. Have you done the gas rate? Yes, all my gas rate is low. Okay, but is your fluid gas analysis correct? Yes. Well, your gas rate may be low because these modern boilers modulate down very, very quickly. They have, unless you've got a huge system, there's a very little chance of it burning on, on maximum rate for a long time. So you've got to allow that in your, in your risk assessment. If it's massively over, so say if you've, it's meant to be 28 kilowatts and you've got 35 kilowatts, you could probably go down the at risk because you say, well, it's over gassed. The boy does not cut out for that. It's got a plastic heat exchanger on the back of the burner that could distort, product combustion could come out. Again, risk assessment. But just the fact that the gas rate is incorrect, you need um, you, you need clarity on, 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 on what it is. Again, there's no one size fits all. If it's, if it's massively out, if, you know, you could argue it, but on a modern appliance, the flue gas analysis will tell you whether it's burning safely or not. Excellent. Brilliant. Cool. Um, John Gardner with a, another follow up question. He asks, uh, not strictly related to GI USP, but why is there no requirement for tightness testing when conducting a LGSR? Because it's not in Regulation 36, is a short answer to that. <laughs> the the GSIUR states that you only do a gas safety, a, a tightness test if you break the gas line. You're not breaking the gas line when you work on the gas. We would always recommend it. We would always recommend you do a gas tightness test when you first enter the property and then when you leave it. I was always taught that was the way it should be. Okay, but it is not a legal requirement. It's a recommendation. But you know, you'd have to take that up with the HSE and people way above my pay grade. For it. <laughs> Absolutely fine. I'm, I'm sure that that's a plenty of answer there. So thank you for that, uh, John. Um, brilliant. Okay, so I'll probably, there's two questions left, so I'll probably leave these two as the last one. So uh, ideally no more questions after this, please. Um, Alan Thomas, he asks, uh, could you repeat what the issue was with the hob burning orange in the video? 
Okay, so the 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 the, the, risk, the issue with it was it was burning kind of a red color. Okay, so in a flame, it, 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 different colored flames will tell you different things. So a yellow flame will tell you that there's not enough oxygen, and the reason it's floppy is it's concerning for the, it's searching for the oxygen. So that would be under get under under oxygenated. If you've got an orange flame, generally it's a bit dust, something like that. Where there's quite a reddish flame, what that is is because of the, the, the nebulizer was leaking, perhaps. They got the mason mask and the, the customer had a nebulizer. So it's an oxygen rich environment. There's chemicals in that oxygen slightly, and that's why it's burning. However, your flame picture was nice and keen. The, it, was a, it was a sharp, keen flame. It was just a little bit of discoloration on the flame. So that's why it wouldn't have been an unsafe situation. If you, like I say, if you turned off the nebulizer or asked the lady to move away, or the person to move away rather, and then you opened all the doors and windows and ventilated it, your flame picture would return to normal. Brilliant. Thank you for that. That's, that's a great answer. Um, final question then in that case, um, oh, breathe, <laughs> is from uh, Eagle. Todor Rinovich, um, regarding TB118, isn't this electrical part of the house rather than forcing us to get extra equipment, etc.? I don't know if that's... Uh, Sorry, say that again? Uh, he says, uh, regarding TB118, isn't this... Yeah. Uh, yeah, you got it. So as a technical 118 is, is the safe to touch. Um, we don't issue, we, we issue guidance. The technical bulletin 118 was, was written in, a, in conjunction with the NIC EIC. It was actually written by Paul Collingwood, one of their members. Um, it is just guidance for a gas engineer how to uh, use safe to touch. It, you know, we're not an electrical body. Um, we, we electrics are outside of our remit. It is purely there to try and help an engineer work safely. That's all it is. If you have any questions about technical one one eight, realistically, it should go to the NIC. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, I think we're pretty much uh, done there and round six o'clock. So good end point. Good so uh, absolutely. So yeah, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to our speakers, uh, John Palmer and Dave Bendel. They've been fantastic, nice. um, you know, really insightful stuff. And I hope uh, everyone in attendance has, has gotten a lot out of this session. As mentioned at the beginning, um, we're recording this session. It will be put on uh, hvpmag.co.uk probably within the next week or so. So please do look out for it there uh, but you know uh, thank you for joining us today it's been great and uh, hopefully you know uh, you know we'll be able to do something like this again in the future all right thanks no very worries. much take thank care you very much. all right cheers bye, bye, -bye.